Hey guys, welcome back. It has been an absolute privilege for me to do this show. And one of the reasons why I love doing it so much is because I get to reach out to my mentors. And a lot of times, often they'll actually say yes and come on the show. Um, in this case, this is the gentleman, one of the people who I can tell you, absolutely, I would have not started my goal of self-improvement had it not been for this guy. Uh, I met him about 17 years ago. He's been a big influence to me and millions of other people. Please welcome Eric Von Markovic, mystery to the show. How you doing, Eric? I'm doing very well. Thank you. I You're love good yourself. <laughs> You're presently in Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Yeah. I am in United Kingdom right now. I'm babysitting. I'm taking care of my kids. I've come to visit. Well, let, let's skip ahead here, man. You, you mentioned one of the biggest changes for you has been your kids. Can you talk about that? Like how that's changed? Because, you know, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was very different. You don't have any kids and you're, you're running around going out every night, uh, you know, looking for different things. How has it changed your perspective? Well, your game definitely changes when your goals change. There's no doubt about it. And everything happens in its season. So while last week I was gaming in the Hollywood Hills because I am single again and looking for my dream girl, I'm looking for my counterpart, my duo act, my double act, you know? So it's not just mystery, but mystery and who? I wonder who. So I went to Hollywood for that. But now that I'm in the UK, it's a 180 switch now. And that lifestyle, just like I have mentioned many times to people, you turn the pickup artist on when you need him and then turn him off when you don't need him. Right. And right now I'm visiting my children who are nine years old and 17 years old. So uh, I'm in I'm in heaven right now. That's awesome, man. That's terrific. Yeah. And I made a comfortable seat here. It's the middle of the night now. The kids are asleep. And now we can talk shop and talk about what happened in Hollywood. It was a good time. That's beautiful. Uh, I want to talk about the first time we met. Um, I did a boot camp with Matador and um, Cosmo back in 07. I still talk to Cosmo all the time. Uh, and and I don't know if you know this, but when you guys did the first season of The Pickup Artist, do you remember at the end, you guys were at a strip club? Do you remember in Austin? I do. That's, I remember vividly. That strip club I worked at for four years before I met you. I was the DJ there. It's so, the irony, I remember I was in the military watching that episode. I'm like, dude, I worked there for four years. It was so, I called the GM afterwards and he told me about the whole situation. Anyway, I've, uh, I've still uh, kept up with Cosmo a little bit. Um, the next boot camp, uh, Matador asked me to come on uh, because it was in Dallas. And I believe I, I met Love Drop there too. And when we went there, it was one of these things where I was like trying to help you with logistics and you and I met for the first time. And I remember watching you emote to women in a way that I had never seen anyone do before, like to the point. So I remember all the other uh, students on the boot camp, they were all fumbling around and looking in different directions. And by the way, guys, this is this is 2008. So we weren't all girls weren't stuck on their phone in 08 because the iPhone set the first iPhone didn't come out until 07. And so the guys were all running around. And I remember we went to this uh, place called Mantis. It was in Dallas. And you, there was a circular booth. And you're sitting there talking to these two girls. And I got behind the booth and listened to every word you said. I was like, I'm here to learn. I'm not here to like try to fucking have fun. This is all work for me. And I remember listening and hearing you getting girls to qualify to you in a way that I, at the, now I'm used to it, but at the time I'd never really heard before. And then, um, you know, long story short, you ended up pulling two girls that night. But uh, that was the first time we first time we met, and it was a pretty pretty different pretty different world back then. I mean, I think the whole world has changed. We went did another boot camp in um, Scottsdale, and then we did another one with uh, in uh, Los Angeles. And I remember at the LA one, you bringing out a Manila envelope. Do you remember the Manila envelope with the photos in it? Uh, and what photos were you, they? You did a photo. photo you did a, do you remember the photo routine? Left. Oh, that's right. That's right. Of course, I had uh, a. a a photo envelope. Yes. With actual printed photos, old school. Yes. That's right. And I remember that and showing you the iPhone 2, I think at the time, and we were both looking at it and you were like, what would a caveman 3,000 years ago is like a piece of glass and like you can make pictures move through it. And I was telling you, I remember at the time I was like, you, the photo routine is now here, right? And then the photo routine kind of moves to Instagram. It kind of moved to social media because social media hadn't really kicked off back then. And so the world has changed pretty significantly there. But that, anyway, that's how we met and it was very impressive. And uh, you know, you and I kept touch for a long time after that. And I'm just curious, um, 
throughout you, throughout your time period here, I, I want to say one of the seminal moments that I remember is the situation with Neil Strauss talking to Jessica Alba. Do you remember this? I remember watching that and thinking he had a chance. He had a chance, right? But he, like it was he's a lovely man. They would have enjoyed each other's company on a, at, at the very least on an intellectual level, if not. There was some sexual tension, perhaps. <laughs> you know? yeah, no, no, I never told you this either. I became friends with Neil uh, after you and I met uh, back in 2012. I took Neil out to uh, here in Vegas for his birthday, so we we kept in touch just for a little bit back then. Uh, he was he was covering Skrillex when Skrillex won. Um, the Grammys, and that's where I met him. So it's funny, I met all three of you separately, and then I, Owen and I, Owen Cook, and I became friends around 2012 when I moved to Los Angeles. So I've never like been in this room with the three of you at the same time, but I, I knew all the three of you separately. Um, but but the, going back to the, that moment, when we see this, there's a mainstream moment. You talk about them uh, parodying you on uh, Saturday Night Live. You know, They make mention of you on like Big Bang Theory, all kinds of different stuff like this. Can you talk about that time period where you are in this book that is a bestseller and then the show the vh1 the pickup artist comes out and then all of a sudden it sort of like hits the mainstream well i think the day i really felt the fame kick in i think that's what we're getting at yeah is when i did conan o'brien the very next day in a, in a new york city Everyone recognized me on the streets. It was it was a, a changing moment. Uh, the show certainly helped in creating a fame, but I think it's the internet that sustains it. Yes. So while I went to Hollywood and I've been away from Hollywood for a good ten years on multiple tours around the world with my good wingman Baxter, whom we'll get into talking about at some point. For I sure. hope. And. I came back and people were recognizing me still. So uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to bring out the best in others when you meet them. It's great. I absolutely love meeting people. I've asked dozens of people uh, for questions that they wanted me to send in to you. And the main question I got like in some form or fashion is, what would you say, because this is something I, I comment on a lot, what would you say as far as like your game back then, let's say, you know, 03 to 07, A1, A2, A3, compared to right now, the biggest change being in social media, what would you say you've had to change uh, in that 20-year period, 15-year period? Now, is that changing my methodology, oh. my procedure, or do you mean personal? Um, because on a personal level, the change is I'm looking for a life mate. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, yeah, no. In yeah. the past, I wasn't. Right. You know, I've already had kids, so I'm not, I don't have a ticking time bomb. I don't have a, a ticking time clock, rather. Yeah. <laughs> and and I am free to pursue, uh, you know, my goals, which which is to have a travel partner. Yeah. I travel a lot, and I plan on traveling a lot more. And it would be really nice to have a lovely travel partner with me. So that's different yeah. because before I was settled into Hollywood and meeting scores and scores of beautiful women and hanging out with them. So, so uh, that's different. I'm, I'm looking for greater intimacy now. Oh, uh, well that, that is a, a, that's part of what I wanted to know. But the other part was the difference in like, for instance, I noticed Back when we used to go out 03 to like say 08, the prettiest girls were at the coolest nightclubs. And I feel like because of Instagram and especially because of OnlyFans, a lot of that has changed. And so what I've had to update is like create events that get them to come out and then create these huge social circles, social proof events in order to make it work. And I'm just curious, like, have you noticed the same thing? Because I feel like social media change, like cold approach, direct pickup or indirect pickup. I think was extremely effective, like just say from 2000 to like 2008, but I think social media made it harder. What do you think? For, perhaps for you, uh, because you've taken, a, you've favored social circle game. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm doing world-class cold approach pickup. That is traveling the world, no swearing. You don't have to swear when we travel. Yeah. You're representing your country when you travel as well. So there's a certain... Uh, level of of uh, uh, etiquette, yeah, that uh, you will operate by, 
right? And uh, and so Baxter and I have been focused on on true cold approach pickup. Now that doesn't mean we're walking up to girls all by themselves. We both recognize that women of beauty are rarely alone. They're usually in groups. Yes. So we're going to meet groups of people and then merge those groups into adjacent groups to create social proof for ourselves and and to create opportunities and choice. So that's a part of cold approach pickup. It's it's a great night out. Yeah. Uh, you are actually, Eric, I think you're the first person to ever say the word social circle to me. I think you were the first person I ever heard the term from. Uh, and then I just took that idea and ran with it. Um, but yeah, I, I've noticed even with cold approach pickup that things are different because of girls being obsessed with their phone and the, the VI, you remember that show out of Canada keys to the VIP, right? It was like access to certain places. It was like cold approach pick. The reason why I bring this up is I live in Las Vegas. Everyone has boot camps here. Every pickup company has boot camps here. And one of the things I noticed is that they can never get on stage. They can never get in the VIP. And that's what social circle brought you. And that was part of the thing that I noticed that was different that I sort of updated in the last 15 years. Does that make sense? Fair, fair. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a really good situation to be in if you're in a city that can afford you to do that. Yeah. Certain cities around the world uh, don't have, you know, the Vegas vibe, we'll call it. Yeah. But we'll call it rooftop patios. Yeah. Because that's the real secret, guys. You know, if there are gentlemen listening in on this, uh, rooftop patios are where you're going Those to find great. Uh, great situations to approach groups of people. It's uh, It's where it's expected, in fact. You know, where you can hear chatter anywhere in the world, you can hear chatter. You're in the right place yeah. for cold approach pickup. And it's a very pleasing sound. And, and no matter what language they speak, it sounds the same. And you know you're in the right place when you hear it. Um, the guys who teach pickup now, there are some people out there that teach it that are way, way, way more direct than you. In fact, there's a a book by Alan Roger Curry called Mode One, where it's basically immediately express massive amounts of intent and let a girl know that you want to have sex with her immediately. Uh, yeah, we we oh, for, oh, forgive me. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just curious. Like, what do you think about that? Like, th these are all derivatives of something that you started. What do you think about where the the whole uh, pickup industry has gone, say, in the last ten years? Well, there's there's a difference between direct and indirect game. Yeah. Indirect game is not a mamby-pamby uh, beating around the bush, metaphorically speaking. It is a way of playing solid game of building true connection and intimacy, in my opinion. Direct game is an offense uh, in many ways. It, it would be an offense in a corporate environment and in world-class pickup there's no place for grabbing a woman's arm as she walks past and pulling her towards you. Mm. Things of that nature, direct game, uh, or, or even approaching a girl by herself. It's so rare, to be honest. Those scenarios are so rare that you should be focusing on the three set. Two thirds of all approach scenarios are the three set. That's three people in a group. So you should be practicing and fantasizing about what to say to a group of people and how to run the set, then what do I say to a girl to attract her to me? It's a different, a different uh, fantasy to, to review in your head over and over until you're ready to deal with the real thing and face beauty head on. So one thing you mentioned in a previous interview, you talked about don't sexualize the conversation, like let the girls do that. So is that, would that be part of the indirect approach? Ooh, don't sexualize. Uh, Bexter, who is an incredible pickup artist and good friend, great friend of mine, we've known each other many years, he doesn't sexualize his pickups, his interactions, but he has an odd sense of humor mm. that is very overtly sexual. And so you're not apologizing for being a sexual being, but you're also not trying to get them aroused. Got it. That's indirect. You know, arousal happens in seduction 
And first you have attraction, then you have comfort, and then you have seduction. If you do it backwards and start in seduction, then you're playing a game of fool's mate. And that comes from chess, chess metaphor. You can win the game of chess in four moves, but that doesn't make you a chess champion. Yeah. That just makes the opponent naive. Doesn't make you better. So a typical game of chess is 25 to 35 moves. A typical game in pickup is going to be somewhere between four and 10 hours, accumulating time by the minute like a lawyer would. <laughs> And uh, you hit the average seven-hour mark, and she'll seduce you. So go after women who are worth the time. What do you have? You inculcated like dating apps or social media into your game at all? I have only met one girl off of Tinder mm. as my experiment, and that relationship lasted two years. I have never tried again. I really don't believe that it works. I hear so many people complaining about having first dates and not having second dates, which is, in my opinion, abysmal failure. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and also, I've played the game a little bit where you're swiping faces one by one. Why can't I design a face and, and it finds the closest matches? in the database, but no, it doesn't do that. You have to swipe one by one, wasting time, looking at one face at a time. It's designed to waste your time. It's designed to make money. It's not designed for true connection, true intimacy. And why not rely on your own instincts of going out and meeting people in real life? Isn't that don't you feel the need sometimes if you're inside too long yeah. alone? Don't you just feel that desire for social interactions and, and it's not going to be satiated by watching another Netflix show or, or swiping, you know, another face you have to meet people in real life. Yeah. And, and, and that's what we call in field. So we get in field. We're known as in fielders. Do you, we do get you, out to the public gatherings. Do you think that having though, like a curated social media profile that would show demonstrations of higher value, do you think that that's something that would be helpful to guys in the dating space? It sounds to me like a, like a, an example of hot game, right? But you know, the, cold approach is where they don't know you. And hot approach is a lot like celebrity game, but you also where you upload your DHVs yeah. prior to their, uh, prior to your arrival. Right. Really. Well, you talk about before about like a time bridge. And what I found is that if your social media is curated very well, the time bridge, the, the likelihood of her flaking is actually much less because your social media is curated. Well, that's what I'm saying. And also in, it okay, replaces well, text game. Uh, I can understand that. Uh, what I suggest to uh, my students, my friends and my students is that they create an Instagram that doesn't lose the girl. Mm. It does. It, you don't have to get the girl with it. You you're going to get her in real life with, you know, and then get her Instagram yeah. and then communicate, uh, you know, on another time. But, uh, you know, to do it the opposite way, uh, you know, to, to, to expect that your Instagram pictures are going to attract her. That, that is, that's not the point. Right. The point is just to not lose her. Yeah. I think Baxter gave us a thumb up or something. Somebody gave us a thumbs up there. All right. So the, the other thing I want to ask you about is uh, I, I had Kezia Noble on here a couple of weeks ago and we talked about this concept. Whereas uh, again, uh, text messaging kind of got big in 04. I remember watching you on stage uh, at Eben Pagan's event, uh, Get Altitude. I don't know if you remember this long time ago. Um, and at that place, they started asking questions about this upcoming technology called text messaging. Then in 04, it kind of took over. It was, it was bigger in Europe before that, but in the United States around 04. Since then, though, uh, the ability to DM on social media platforms, like where your photo is still there instead of being 10 digits, do you recommend still text messaging or do you like using, do you ever DM girls like for a time bridge to, to meet up with them again? Uh, well, there are two types of women on my Instagram, for instance. Those I've met and those I haven't. Yeah. So I'm only really concerned with those I've met because those are people that uh, I would think are new friends. Right. 
So I'm not trolling on Instagram looking for women I've never met before and hoping to somehow convince them through the internet to see them in real life. Instead, I'm communicating with new friends that I've already met. So there's a distinction there. Yeah. I'm not using Instagram as a resource for attracting new leads, as it were. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Uh, I don't know if you uh, know, there's a friend of mine, she's a playmate, CJ Sparks, and she had a question for you. Uh, she said, she asked, did you ever hook up with anyone famous in the pillow pit? Uh, does he know where Herbal is? And does he have any idea of the old homemade movies? And when is the last time he used the dual induction massage? That's what uh, CJ wanted to know. Those are a lot of questions. Yeah. All she's trying to do is tell her that she understands where I've been. Yeah. That's all. That's I've been beautiful. around the block. She's read about me. That's what that's about. Yes, that's uh, where do we begin? Let's let's the pillow let's pit. play along. I like them. Uh, what's the first one? Did you ever hook up with anyone famous in the pillow pit? Uh, well, in the pillow pit era, uh, everyone's a starlet in Hollywood. <laughs> for, oh, for people uh, who don't know, for people who don't know, right there on Queens and Sunset, there was a house right above that Mel's Diner. That's where Project Hollywood was. We can say it now because they've torn the house down recently. Uh, but that's where the house was. And replaced it with a better house. Yes, it's a beautiful house. I actually, when Vince Kelvin uh, was working there, I actually went in there. I saw the pillow pit. I saw all the rooms. Uh, that was the only time I've ever been inside of uh, Project Hollywood. But uh, there's been several other projects that have popped up since you guys did that. There's been two Project Las Vegas. There's is, is a Project New York. They're all over the place. Project Miami. Uh, that happened since you guys did that. But um, yeah. Project San Francisco as Pro well. Project I've been to, to their place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, the pillow pit, the pillow pit era. Talk about it. The pillow pit era. Well, we're going back in time. What I would do is bring new friends back to the pad after uh, night clubbing, you know, after hours. And I would throw people into the pillow pit, they'd lie down, and a projector facing the ceiling would show some 10-minute home movies. And I would just put a 10-minute home movie on and then say, hey, let's get out of here and let's go eat. And then we'd walk down to Mel's Diner. But in that time, they were in my house for only 10 minutes, but in watching a home movie, it was like hanging out with me, you know, virtually for hours. And then... We left the place, grabbed a bite to eat, and then welcomed them to come back for a hot tub. If they came back a second time, that was strong evidence that they were comfortable with their presence. Yeah, that was a good game plan. Yeah, I love that game plan, and I love the fact that you said when you bring back new friends. Like the, when I talk about this, because I have to explain, I know from Eric, uh, for me, because I have to deal with so many other pickup artists, I go on debates and we talk to them all the time, and I'm like, and they'll sometimes they'll quote you, and I'm like, I know Eric, and I know what he would believe here. The concept of going indirect, I actually got from you. Uh, the concept of like not overtly sexualizing. So you even said, when I bring back new friends, that's something else that I also sort of learned from you. I don't treat men and women any differently. Whenever I come up to them, everyone is just my friend. Some of the prettiest girls you've ever seen in your life. And by the way, I'm inviting you to come be a judge at my bikini competition this summer. Some of the prettiest girls I've ever met in my life. I come up to them like, what up, motherfucker? I'm like, what up, bro? And we'll just fist bump. I treat them just like my guy friends. Um, I'm in. Huh? You're in? I'm in. Okay, here we go. That is the dream come true. That sounds like great fun. Well, but, but here's the other thing though. Like you're you're part. You'd be part of my social circle, and that's the thing. What I loved about social circle it was that it gave me access. It got me into the Playboy Mansion. It got me on stage at the Maxim parties. It got me into that kind of stuff. It gave me a level of access that I thought was pretty amazing, and it allowed me to be indirect because of a concept you talk about pre-selection. A uh, pre-selection is really easy to do when you walk into a club with 10 girls. And it's actually easier to walk into a club with 10 girls than you think. It actually is way That's easier than you think. pre-selection. Yeah. It's that way is pre-selection. You don't need 10 girls. Two is okay. Two, two is good. Yeah. You two is good. Two. Four is better. You know, then you're chaperoning. But if you go in with two women, it's going to sweeten the hot spot. It's going to get you in faster. And it's also going to allow you to open adjacent sets with greater safety. That's something that has to be considered. When you open up a new group of people, they're going to judge what emotional state you're in. So if you open with a big ass smile, they know you're in a good mood and they'll be less threatened by your approach. But a lot of guys don't smile in the direct approach. Yeah. They're like, hey, what's up? You know, they're trying to be sexy and they're opening in seduction. 
uh, they're back ass they're they're ass backwards they're they're opening at the end you know when you when you uh, watch a christmas movie love story or a hallmark love story they don't kiss at the beginning they kiss at the end of the, of the love story pickup is supposed to be a love story remember that that's that's an, that's why it's called the pickup arts Nice. And uh, she also, uh, CJ Sparks wanted to know when was the last time you used the dual induction massage or was that just a, a Neil thing? That's more of a Neil thing. Yeah. That was more of a Neil thing, but it was, it was a way of getting, you know, of moving forward in, in that situation. Do you uh, want to tell the, the dual tell people about the dual induction massage? Uh, he was in, it's in the book, the game. Um, it's funny. Cause I, I was at Dan Blazarian's house uh, two days ago and we were talking about this, this concept not in the, not the dual induction massage, but just Neil in general. Because uh, Neil, uh, for those of you who don't know, Neil Strauss did the first edit of Dan's book, The Setup, uh, because Dan was such a fan of the way the game was written. Uh, but in the dual induction massage thing, he's in a bathtub. He's like taking a bath in front of these girls or something like that. And then they were twins. Is that it? I'm trying to remember. I haven't read the book in like 10 years. But uh, they were twins. And then all of a sudden they got to a deal, a deal where it's him and the girl and they're giving a massage in like a circular motion, but it has to be the same circular motion. And then the two girls would do him. And then the one and the other girl would do, and then it would eventually lead to a threesome. That was the way it was presented in the book. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I'm sure he had a good time uh, practicing that gambit. Yeah. That game piece <laughs> sounds fun. Um, when you talk about uh, the, the term was pivot, uh, having a girl that you go into the club with, or a girl that's, that's friends with, do you ever, instruct a girl that you go out with what you want to do beforehand do you ever give them any instructions no 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 other other than i make sure they're in a good mood and that they're uh willing to be social i do say we're going to meet a lot of people tonight yeah. so you know get ready to put your uh, your game face on and that puts them in state so that they're going to meet lots of people and then, you know, there have been times I've run boot camps, which are three day events. We take the a, a group of men out in downtown entertainment district uh, environments, venues like nightclubs. And uh, and we meet scores of women. What was my thought? Uh, I was getting I was digressing. Uh, what was the are you uh, talking about? So, the so, so I have I have some female friends that are pivots and they're usually like big models. And like so right. often they'll be married or have boyfriends or whatever, but they're just girls that I go out with and we'll go out to we'll go on stage at a nightclub or whatever. And then like let's say I'm talking to a girl. This is back when I was single. Let's say I'm talking to a girl, I would tell kindly, I'm like, wait 30, count to 100, and then after 100, come and reach from me behind and pull me away from this girl. I would tell them to do things like that. Or I'd have my other friend come up and like kiss me on the cheek while I was talking to a girl. And it all was good. It was so that's what I yeah, mean by like good. by preparing beforehand with pre-selection. Uh no, I I I don't prepare them, but I do jealousy plot lines. And that's where you open two sets and let both uh uh women of interest in each group meet each other mm. and merging sets and by merging sets yeah. there's two ways of merging sets by the way there's a forward merge that's where you say come on let's go make some friends and you meet new people or you backwards merge to a previously open set or the people you came with by saying hey let me introduce you to some, some good people hey let me introduce you to some good people that's a sound bite you know or let's go make some friends so you've got two sound bites to use in field to do something to move the set along. You know, you've created some social proof. Good. Now let's open the next set and get the next girl interested in you because she's seen you with the first girl. That's pre-selection. 80% of attraction is pre-selection. And that's kind of the secret to how, how you get a hotter girl yeah. is she sees you with women and feels safer around you so and more intrigued. So again, the, we talk about the the divergence of because when you were teaching pickup, it's very different than what the way it is now, Eric. I'm just telling you right now. Like, uh, do you believe? Well, that I'm in. I'm. I was in Hollywood this you know past week, yeah. and I've been gaming nonstop over yeah. the last several years. So yeah, I'm up to speed as well. I I really feel it. No, what what I mean by that is there's a lot of guys out there who think things that you don't agree with. Like for instance, the concept of men and women being friends. Do you believe men and women can be friends? Oh, that's philosophical. That doesn't really come into play uh, during my boot camps. Uh, can we be friends? Of course we can be friends. You know, I'm friends with my children's mother. Yes. Right? Uh, 
so yes, we can be friends. No doubt. Absolutely. That's, that's a case in point is I'm friends with my children's mother. Um, well, so, how, how about the concept of you having a bunch of female friends that you go out with and be social with on a regular basis who introduce you to other women? I think that's really a level of game that everyone is, everyone in pickup aspires to do. Level one is opening groups. Level two is merging sets. Level three is allowing last night to assist you in this night's successes by bringing women out with you again. And level four game is building a social life, a whole month's work of work, going out four nights a week, meeting a dozen groups of people per night, getting three numbers a night. It's your choice to, you know, with who you want to uh, see again. Yeah. You're going to, at the end of that month, have collected somewhere around 50 numbers. Yeah. Right? So, so you might and say... out of that, how many show up to a party? Yeah. You might say doing cold approach to build a social circle. Exactly. Playing... What, what if you started in, in a new city where you don't have a social circle? Well, you got to start at level one, son. You have yeah. no other option than to start with what you see. You know, there's a three set. Go open it. Right? Uh, hopefully you'll see them again and they'll come out with you the next time, hopefully the next night, and you'll get a snowball effect happening in a, in a party weekend rolling. That's yeah. how we do it. We choose three venues per night on boot camp. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, man, I can't wait for you to come out to Vegas, man. I really can't because what you just described is is what I've been trying to build here. Um, so now... Uh, you, you did, uh, an interview with Owen the other day. Um, Owen, obviously, you know, he said, you know, you're one of his mentors, very important person on his journey. Owen, since then, I personally, I've said this before in, in, in person, I think Owen Cook is the best speaker I've ever seen. I think he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you've seen him do seminars before. He's just absolutely really, really of good. Of course. Um, we did seminars together. Yes. Uh, more than that, I'm, I'm very proud that he has found his voice. He found his voice. Yeah. Um, Owen said something that I te absolutely agree with, and I was feeling this exact thing. And he goes, people just want to know that you're happy and you're alive. And I thought that, you know, too, Eric, it was like one of these things where, because I remember I had the discussion with you and Bexter before about the concept of like you guys going on podcasts. And my whole thing is like, I know there's a part of people that want to know like what is mystery secret technique for this, but there's also mil millions of people who just love you, man, and just wanted to know that you're alive because we hadn't heard from you in years. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, uh, a lot of the students that we get are through word of mouth. And so we don't have to do a lot of marketing. Yeah. So when you travel the world, city to city, people fly into those cities to see you. So uh, I've just been busy living my life in travel mode, right? So uh, I haven't had a chance to get back to Hollywood until last week. I was there for 10 days. And, uh, and I was gone for, I think that was at least 10 years. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, wait, 10 years. So I was, I was there with you in 20. So it was April of 2014. You and I were on a, a, a hotel rooftop bar. It was you, me, Matt, uh, mystery. And then we got a call from, uh, my buddy Usman and we went over to Dan Bilzerian's house. Do you remember that? We went to Dan Bilzerian's house. Back I remember. On Blue Jay, and we had I dinner remember. at his place. I do. Uh, he was a great host. Yeah. It was great food, great host. And, uh, and, uh, I met, uh, an eclectic group of his friends. Yeah. Abigail Ratchford was there. Lynn Oding was there. Lynn Oding is the director of uh, Reacher and Cobra Kai and different. He was there that day. And then, uh, uh I love just, Cobra Kai. Justin Ross Lee was there also. Uh, that was a pretty, pretty wild. I, I keep, I so I show pictures of that date. I'm like, nobody will believe we were all in the same room at the same time. Like, but yeah, that was 10 years ago. That was almost exactly 10 years ago. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair cool. enough. Well, that was pretty much the last time I was down there. Yeah. I've since done Europe and, uh, and I've been training, uh, groups of people in small groups, city to city around the world. And I've done quite literally hundreds now it's, it's, it's how you can change lives more dramatically. You know, it's one thing to offer my book to someone, uh, in, a, a, as a means of improving their life. But if they can come and spend three days with me, that that's a game changer. Um, one thing that, you know, you brought, I believe, 
the the concept of going up and doing cold approach for women into the mainstream. I think Owen brought the idea of like teaching it through YouTube to the mainstream. I think he was probably the first one, the first biggest one to do that. And I'm curious, um, is there plans maybe for you in the future, mystery on a panel show with a bunch of girls or mystery doing a podcast or something like that where we can get, you know, I think a lot of people would like consistent content from you. Well, I'm, you know, considering strongly coming to Vegas and uh, being a part of that contest. A hundred percent. So yeah, I'm a very busy man. Okay. Well, we, we've uh, announced it now. You're coming on Access Vegas whenever you come here. Awesome, man. Here's the bat. Uh, here we go. Owen Cook uh, also wants to know: Do you uh, does it fully sink in how many people you've helped? Uh, I'm getting feedback, which is you know I'm very grateful for. You know, uh, fan mail saying you've changed my life, which is quite incredible. Uh, it's interesting to note that many children are on this planet because of the work I've done. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is, that's great feedback to get pictures of their children, you know, and for them to say, thank you. That's, that's awesome. I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, no doubt. Have you been aware of the red pill and manosphere space that is sort of a derivative of pickup? Have you, in the last 10 years, have you been aware of that at all? Yes, I have. And uh, it sounds to me like, you know, we're, what we're talking about, uh, or what we could talk about, uh, is the concept of incels involuntary celibate. So, so I think, uh, the, they, I think, I think, here, hold on, Eric, but I think the concept of incels yeah. is being handcuffed to that to that space more so than it's real. Like the, when I think of red pill and manosphere, I think of self-help. Same with pickup then. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, you know, for sure. Re uh, whenever someone in pickup does something weird or creepy, then all pickup artists get blamed for it. And then the same thing with the manosphere and red pill. It's like they all, it just feels like it's one of these pejoratives to just say anyone who believes in male self-improvement like this to call them an incel. So while there, I do agree that there are incels, they did a uh, survey the other day and they tried to find self, um, self-described incels and it was like less than one half of one percent of like less than one tenth of one percent of the community so i think the incel thing is massively massively overblown and i feel like it's it's used as almost like a political ploy to sort of um what uh, what's the word i'm looking for uh, to discredit your opponent does that make sense like if you if you're against, uh, yeah. against this whole concept then you're going to use the term incel because that's so that word is being used so much and i just don't see it nearly to the extent uh, where people would consider themselves that well, I was thinking more along the lines of those who truly, you know, have issues yes. meeting women. The The truth of the matter is, and I, this is an old quote that I've said, if you cannot attract a woman, you are, by definition, sterile. Yeah. So pickup is very important. All men must have a pickup artist inside them to turn on when needed and then turn off when not. That's that's something that every man must, uh, you know, must uh, step up to. And you can get help. That's what's amazing is you can find a mentor. That's the number one thing that I, I think is is a game changer is seek a mentor. If you do that, you will uh, you're going to save yourself a lot of, of pain and you'll be shown the real way to get to where the women are and also how to meet them, how to attract them, how to qualify them, how to build comfort with them, move them into a lock-in position so that you can build comfort with them and obtain a contact in, uh, contact number, contact information rather, that r will allow you to continue the conversation rather than get rid of you quick. It's interesting. That's consistent, yeah. you know, in pickup is you're gonna go through these phases and if you learn solid game, you're going to get what we call consistency, son. It's it's something that some men have and, you know, like Baxter. <laughs> and, uh, and it's something that some men are looking, you know, very forward to having. And that's why they practice so much. 
Can you go over the concept of, of qualification? So there's a there was a book. It's uh, I believe it's Data Clism, which is the CTO of eHarmony. He wrote this book, and it, they did this. Uh, they transcribed these dates. They were they're basically speed dates. They went on, and they wanted to see when they did the transcription, what were the words or phrases that caused the people to go on second dates, third dates, etc. They were just trying to find some correlation. They did this with thousands of different interactions, and what they found is that when the woman said the word I or me more than like six or seven times, the likelihood of them going on a second date skyrocketed. When the man said I or me six or seven times, it had no effect on it. And I remember you were probably one of the first persons I talked to about, about getting people to talk about themselves. Can you go into that concept of like qualification? Sure. The conversational ratio at first, when we first open a set, is 90% us, 10% them. And that 10% is just an illusion of interactivity. It's really about us. And it's the first three to five minutes that we're going to shine, that we're going to demonstrate higher value and run the set with storytelling. And, and you're sequencing a, a series of storytelling gambits together in succession to fill your timeline. But then there comes a time about five, eight minutes in where it's time to reverse the conversational ratio and allow her to invest in you. And by doing that, she's much more likely to want to hold on to that investment and see you again. So it's a good game plan. In fact, qualifying isn't just a gambit that we do. It's so important that it's become a phase, a phase of gambits known as A3. It's the third phase of the attraction stage. There's a beginning, middle, and ending to attraction. The first beginning is A1, which is opening the set. Then A2 is demonstrating higher value or attracting the set. And then A3 is qualifying the set and asking questions that draw the best out in others. So one example of a qualifier question that I think is very good, uh, I've used it recently, is if you had to sing on America's Got Talent in two weeks' time, and you had to, what would you sing? Or would you dance? Or would you do comedy? you got to do something to impress Simon Cowell. That gets people investing in you. It's a very creative way of getting them to invest. Lots of questions you can ask, but there's a time and place for them, and it's not on the open. The, uh, the concept of evolutionary psychology, I've heard you mention it a few times. Um, have you read Dr. David Buss? Have you read, uh, Leah Cod or have you read uh, Stephen Stewart Williams or read any of those people, Joffrey Wilson or Hector Garcia? I've read the red queen, the red queen, by Matt, Ridley. Matt Ridley. So that's evolutionary biology, but yes, it's, it's a lot of where right. we have proclivities that lead to our um, survival. So do you have a fundamental belief that it is the things that led to our survival, those proclivities that we had that were passed down from generation to generation? Those are the things often we trigger that cause attraction, meaning attraction is not a choice. Attraction is hardwired in through our evolutionary psychology. I agree. I believe so because I have traveled the world and we've done cold approach pickup to uh, women around the world in different cultures, different uh, ethnicities, and the emotional circuitry in every woman, in every person around the world seems to be relatively the same. If you do something uh, atrocious, like kick a puppy, forgive me for the thought, uh, and you laugh, well, then you've got something wrong with your circuitry. Yeah. And that's a red flag. And people are looking for red flags. So in pickup, what we want to do is, is offer green flags, a bunch of green flags, and minimize the red flags. And we call the green flags DHVs, or demonstrations of higher value. And we call the red flags DLVs, demonstrations of lower value. Make sense? And so what we want to do is DHV that we've got value for her, and she will want to align with those who have value. Um, That's attraction. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, do you, when it comes to DHVs, because I felt like there was a lot of controversy and confusion on this one concept. And this is the difference between like you telling a girl you're, you're a doctor and she finds out you're a doctor. Or you telling a girl you have a Lamborghini and she finds out you have a Lamborghini. Are you telling a girl you, she has, you're famous and then she comes out and finds that she's famous. Allowing like low perceived effort in order for someone to... Um, 
express or experience a DHV? Is that something you recommend? I love that idea. In yeah. fact, that I I would think came from Neil. Yeah. Uh, Neil Strauss, the pickup artist formerly known as Style. Yeah. Uh, Neil would. Uh, what was uh, what was this again? So, me. so the concept of like letting someone discover something of higher value about That's you right. versus you telling them overtly. He would tell people that he was a writer mm. in field when we'd go to nightclubs. He'd tell people he's a writer, but he wouldn't say he's Neil Strauss. He wouldn't say he's rock critic for Rolling Stone magazine. He wouldn't say he's New York Times bestseller several times over. He would just say he's a writer. That was that was all he would throw in field to his sets. And otherwise, he would then run interesting gambits and he would demonstrate that he's an interesting man to the point of building enough comfort to get them back to the house. It wasn't until they got back to the house uh, that they got back to the house that they would then witness firsthand the books that he's written on his shelves. Right? He was holding his best DHVs for later. Yeah. And where they hit harder rather than trying to brag about them, he would just reveal that when the time was right, when he wanted to get to know them more and have them know about him, bring them back to his house. They see his books and they realize, wow, he's Neil Strauss. That's that's a good game plan. That is a good game plan. But uh, Dan Blazarian in his book, The Setup, he talks about uh, social media being able to like show scalable levels of high value with low perceived effort. So can you... Would you think that that would probably also be a pretty good strategy? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a magician. Yeah. So it's nice to create a magical moment for a group of people. And a woman witnessing that can see the social savvy that I have. And yeah. that's a DHV. It isn't the magic that's the DHV. It's the ability to perform the magic to a group that she witnesses. That is the true DHV. Uh Forgive me on this. What was the thought again? Yeah, yeah. No, God, we're just, we're talking about with with social media specifically, like how social media is a way to show DHVs, but like they get to discover this thing about you instead of you being overt about it. Right, and that being a good idea. Uh, I I brought up the magic because yeah. I'd like to see you film your magic. Doing magic. Well, there's a distinction between doing magic and lying. I'm yeah. not lying when I'm doing magic. I'm saying I'm, I'm going to show, show some magic. Yeah. And then I wow them. They know that I'm performing an illusion of some sort, right? No matter how good or bad it is, it's an illusion. But lying is a different ballgame. You, you know, you can lie and say you have a Lamborghini and never show it to her. She never gets to see it because it's in the shop. But I don't recommend that. You know, my nine-year-old son has DHVs. He doesn't have to invent them. You know, he's a winner of races. He's a winner of, of coding uh, competitions. Uh, he's got enough DHVs to not have to worry about faking them. Uh, Eric, you had a, a set of attraction triggers, and I don't remember how many of them they were, but I remember it was leader of men, protector of loved ones, willingness to emote, willingness to walk away. Do you remember what all those were? Yeah, successful risk taker. And number one that you missed there was the number one. Was pre selection, yeah, exactly. Pre -selection. It's yeah. like eighty percent of attraction right there. Awesome. And could you go over leader of men? Because I mean, uh, you know, I was a military officer when when you and I first met, and um, it is one of these things where I've noticed that when I can command the room or the event or whatever, like I just have to do less in order to build attraction. Well, it's it's a demonstration of your ability to be social in a, a leadership capacity, no doubt. Uh, leader of men is a trigger. It is something that by joining the tribal leader, she gets the benefit of the tribal leader's social circle as friends as well. You know, what I, what I say to guys is you're not just getting a new girlfriend, you're getting a new family. And she's getting a new family too. You know, if, if uh, I draw a woman into my life for long term, she's going to meet my family, friends and loved ones, and, and she's going to be a part of them. So there's a lot more you can offer, legitimately offer, 
than just some words of DHVs. Got it. That's awesome. Yeah. The, but the leader of men thing I always thought was interesting. Uh, the willingness to emote and the willingness to walk away, like the abundance mentality of the willingness to walk away. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it needs to be demonstrated at least once in your set, a willingness to walk away. You know, on the timeline of, of hiccup, from meeting her to beginning a sexual relationship, that timeline we call courtship, at some point there's a waypoint where I will say something along the lines of, all right, you're losing me. 25 minutes into set when she's invested, and I say, all right, you're losing me, for something she said, and then I walk off, and she has to re-engage in the conversation and win me over. I'm breaking rapport, and she's working to mend it, and once it's mended, it's much stronger, and, and we appreciate each other. You know, we have to be willing to walk away. She'll demonstrate it once, too, you know? And then you have to also sometimes demonstrate the willingness to chase. You see, we will do some of the chasing, but a lot less than the direct approach. It's a matter of when we do the chasing. You see, we want to be chased too. In fact, that's a game changer. If you choose the narrative of you being the prize and the woman chasing you, you're going to fare way better off than if you were to be chasing her and playing man hands. Instead of, for example, instead of putting your hand on her knee, take her hand and put it on your knee and mm. say that's all you get. Compliance. And now, we, now we're now we off into compliance. Exactly, yeah. no doubt. Uh, so so let's talk about that. The This concept, this is the way I describe it to my, my clients. Uh, and I don't teach a dating course. I teach a networking course, but there is a component in it where we, where we go over the dating concept. And that is the idea that if a woman is giving you attention, you don't respond with validation only when she gives you compliance. If a woman is giving you attention, you can break rapport again and try to get to talk to her again. But we only respond with, we only accept compliance. Meaning when guys are like leaving heart eye emojis on a girl's Instagram post who, and the girl doesn't even know who the guy is, or if the guy is like, um, it, like what you mentioned before, direct game. So in direct game, you're giving your value away because you're letting this girl know you get my attraction in exchange for nothing. You did no work to get my attraction and now you get it. Versus what Neil Strauss does with Jessica Alba, which he says, beauty is common. Can you tell me three things that make you different? Now she's qualifying to you, which is a form of compliance. So the concept where I keep trying to explain to my, uh, my clients is compliance is below the belly button and attention is above the belly button. Her sending you nudes, that's attention because she sent those nudes to 34 other dudes. Her coming to your place when you ask her, invite her over, that's compliance. So you reward compliance, but not necessarily attention. You can still you know, continue the interaction with attention, but attention doesn't necessarily mean the girl wants to sleep with you, whereas compliance tends to mean that a little bit more. Qualification going through the uh, entire comp compliance ladder. Well, yeah, there's a ladder, exactly. Yeah. There's a yes ladder. And there's also something known as compliance momentum, where you thank them for small compliance tests, such as, could you hold my drink for a moment kindly? Thank yeah. you. And then take it back when you've tied your shoe, for instance. Right? Uh, and then they can grow. Uh, they get rewarded and it's pleasing to please you. So that compliance momentum escalates and it can escalate all the way to beginning a sexual relationship. No doubt. Have you noticed the, the, the correlations between like say sales, like telephone sales and the way seduction and pickup works? I believe that my M3 model in many ways can be used in business. And it's, it's just a, another sales model. Yeah. There's many different, uh, marketing, uh, procedurally generated, uh, patterns. Yeah. And my M3 model, which is the structure to a pleasing pickup can fit uh, in business as well. So I've heard people use it for business purposes. Uh, just to... uh, I don't myself, or you know, or or do I? Maybe I. Do. Maybe you do. 
but like a, a, Maybe set, I do. a set of yeses, like a compli like a compliance momentum. I just had Jeremy Miner on my show, and he something he talked about is just getting a series of yeses uh, in order to you know make, close the deal, and make the sale. Uh, Ned, I have not gone over the M three model in probably ten years. A one, A two, A three. Can you remind everybody what were those? I believe well, it was nine phases. Uh, let me tell you that there's only three stages, mm -hmm. and there's a beginning, middle, and ending to each of the three stages. There's the attraction stage, the comfort stage, and the seduction stage. And it has to happen as a timeline in order. There's the beginning, middle, and ending to attraction, A1, A2, A3. Beginning, middle, and ending to comfort, C1, C2, C3. And beginning, middle, and ending to seduction, S1, S2, S3. We've just named them. Now that we've named them, we can do something even more important than knowing structure. We can fill the structure with material that meets the objectives of each of the phases. You want to get good at pickup, learn the phases, and then get good at the delivery of the material that meets the objectives of the phases. So in A1, you're opening. In A2, you're demonstrating higher value and, and priming her to want to qualify herself. In A3, you're qualifying her and moving her into a lock-in position where you can sit down and then build comfort with her. And you're doing that in every set, A1, A2, A3, move to C1. Next set, A1, A2, A3, move to C1. And even when you're merging, you're, you're then in C1 with one group as you're opening the next set, and you're in A1 with them while you're in C1 with the girls that are with you already. And then you catch up the next group, A1, A2, A3, move to C1, and everyone's in C1 together. And that's really where everyone wants to be. You want to be seated next to a beautiful woman of your choice, uh, arm in arm, getting to know each other. But you have to handle the logistics of her being in a group first. Can you go over that? Because logistics was something that um, I also see as like a big problem for some guys and a big advantage for others. So, for instance, if you have the penthouse that's near where all the people go out, all the girls can come meet at your place beforehand. You guys can go out and then come back. You're at Project Hollywood. You're on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles uh, and th those kind of places. Can you go over the importance of logistics, the uh, logistics of dealing with a friend? The, like, for instance, I'll, t I'll tell you one thing. I live in Vegas. I have a car that can seat six people and I don't drink. So I'm always out. And then at the end of the night, everyone just jumps in my car and we go home. It's always been like that. Uh, it's something I've always liked to do. Can you go over the importance of like doing that versus the guy who wants to buy all the land 47 minutes away from the city. And then, so now there's this huge state break have, that happens. Yes. I have thoughts on this. Yeah. You know, some people are living in a small town. What I recommend that they do is go for three days to a big city, even Amsterdam, like get on an airplane, go somewhere, meet up with a friend if you'd like, otherwise go alone. You won't be alone for long because you're going to open the first set on the left when you go to the public venues, right? You have no other option, son, than to get out of that small town and go convince a woman to come back with you to your small town, which you can do in three days. You know, it's called pickup. You can pick up a girl, kiss her, build intimacy, and then talk to her on the phone and say, I'd like you to come visit me. I'm 47 minutes away. And if you have connected with her enough, maybe she'll indulge in that compliance, right? What's the other option? Do what we did. Move to a city. <laughs> when we went to Hollywood, we picked a we picked a location that was close to the eatery, which is the comfort building location, which was close to the attraction location. You see, all pickups go through three physical locations. Your attraction location where you meet the girl and her group. Remember, it's always groups. Then there's the comfort building location, like Mel's Diner, which was just down the street from the Standard Lounge, and then up to our pad, which is the seduction location. Yeah. And if they're uncomfortable, you can always leave the seduction location, go back to the comfort location, and go again later. They'll be much more comfortable that they've been there once before. I got that from David D'Angelo. Beautiful, yeah. David D'Angelo, man, that was a very different time back then. I still remember Cheers that. to David D. David D'Angelo. That's right. Evan Pagan. Um, the he brought us all together. He, it was really, it yeah. was really a wonderful thing that he did. Yeah, there was some momentum, but he because he brought everybody else together. You're right. That that's what caused it to be able to have some exponential growth in that time period.
And I bought a really cool rock star suit that I got to wear on his uh, DVD set. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if we can, I wonder if we can find that anywhere. Get elevated. Uh, well, no, not get elevated. That was the double your dating. D- get elevated double your was dating. where he explained D-Y- how to do the screen, the, the squeeze page and all that stuff. Uh, uh, let's go over this. You talked about this with Owen the other day, the, the concept of having delusional belief in yourself. Can you go over that? I have often have salespeople and they'll ask me this question and they'll be like, when you're assuming the sale, do you, does delusional belief something you need in order to go approach sets that people you don't know or, or is it more like systematic? Well, when you believe you can do something, you're just going to get people telling you you can't if you tell them what you're going to do. So instead you just do it and tell them what you've done. That, that seems to be a better game plan than doing it the other way around. You, you also mentioned, those are my thoughts. You also mentioned competence over confidence. Can you go over that? You, you're more interested in coming off as competent. What is, what would that look like to the, the woman that you're talking to? Well, knowing what you're saying without having ums, ahs, pregnant pauses, awkward moments that people add into their performance, pick up as a performance. And if they don't know their material well, they may screw it up. So what I recommend people do is know your opener. Know what you're going to say before you say it. That really reduces approach anxiety dramatically. It helps. And uh, you've also mentioned before, you like I know you loved Kiev. There's different cities that you really enjoyed going to. What were some of your favorite places to travel? I loved Kiev, and six weeks later, it was unfortunately destroyed, or at least the area I was living. Mm. Uh, yeah, that was a good place. In fact, my favorite rooftop patio was in Kiev. It was just replete with beauty. That said, St. Petersburg was beautiful as well. Mm. Moscow was an incredible city. I was, I was, uh, we lost audio here. Eric, Eric, we lost your audio. Can you turn your audio off and on again real quick? Your, your mute button. Seems to auto connect. Yeah, we're good. Are you there? Yeah, we're good. Oh, so sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. So you were talking about uh, uh, Moscow, but well, there. So, so the way I see it is, there's Moscow, then Saint Petersburg, then Kiev, then Finland, beautiful city for gaming in. The women there are really smart. Helsinki, Helsinki. Yeah, they're smart. They're educated. They're down to earth they're not pretentious but they're savvy and they're very beautiful so i love finland then there's sweden and then we're off to other cities such as barcelona i love the tourists that come to barcelona and we're doing a boot camp in barcelona next nice um so everywhere around uh, everywhere around the world there's different ratings of you know what are your chances of finding uh love and uh and i'd say barcelona's up there is one of the paradise cities because of the way they have it set up right by the beach have you been to barcelona yes okay so you know that right by the beach there are a bunch of clubs mm. and we are hooked up in those clubs so that's where we'll be playing what about south america are there any places there that you enjoy i've been I've been on a tour of seven cities in seven weeks of South America. That was over ambitious, but we did it. Florianopolis, Buenos Aires, Rio, etc., cetera, and uh, Peru, uh, Lima, Peru, rather. Uh, what did I think of it? I'm going back. That's okay. what I think. <laughs> there we go. That's I'm going answer. back at some point. Uh, I also would like to go to Colombia, so I have it on the map to go to Colombia, but we're changing dates. Okay. I'm not, I, I'm with my kids instead for now, but I will head down to Colombia at some point and uh, show the uh, the boys how it's done. Incredible. 
Uh, you said you have a fascination recently with artificial intelligence. What do you, uh, I do. how does that fit into what you're doing? I do. Well, it's separate from what I'm doing. I've created a rule book that's around 240 pages now with the help of the AI that gets read by the AI and it is an operating system for your mind. The AI acts as an operating system that allow that allows you to, in a narrative story, do anything. It gives you the ability to create anything, to summon anyone, living or dead, uh, fictional or not, and to create anything. Uh, wait, create, summon, and teleport. That was the third one. It's magic. And you can teleport to any fictional location in a narrative. It is magic. It is like an interactive fiction book on steroids because it's an open world and infinite. It's called Headspace OS. And it's available at delusionmagical.com. I wrote it. I'm a writer, as you know. And I, I've written some books that got turned into audiobooks, but that wasn't enough for me. So I wanted an interactive audiobook. And I've created it. Because thanks to ChatGPT's audio interface, you can now speak to the rule book and it speaks back to you and you can have a conversation. Just, it, it's absolutely brilliant. I'm really proud of what I've accomplished. You know, and, it, and it's not often that one man can do something like that. Normally it takes a team, but I was able to, to get inspired and, uh, and create that. You mentioned while you were in uh, Los Angeles, you got a, did you get a chance to meet up with Neil? I didn't No, we had WhatsApp issues. I had no SIM card while I was down there. So, mm. uh, he also had his father in town, he said, and, uh, and, uh, he was taking care of his kid. So I think he was quite busy, but he said, next time, was next there, time, baby, next time. Was there an issue with you coming to the States and has that issue been cleared up or how, how did that hold? Uh, no, no, no issues at all. Uh, I am working on getting an O-1 work visa again. So this last visit was purely for entertainment. I spent just 10 days gaming with Baxter, and we went to the Hollywood house parties. So that's even better than the rooftop patios. If you were going to rank U.S. cities, what were some of the U.S. cities that you actually like going out in the most? Mm. Let's rank them together. Scottsdale, Arizona. Weren't you impressed? So, so you and I are on, on the, so I don't know if you remember this. Uh, you and me were talking to this two set inside of El Jefe in Scottsdale, Arizona. One of them, the girl, I remember her name was Chelsea. She's from uh, uh, Nebraska. And then one of them went to go get this great Jeep Grand Cherokee, pick us up. And so I jump in the back seat and I'm yelling, Eric, get the fuck in the car. Get here. Do you remember this? Oh, you probably don't remember this. Really? I do not remember it. It's <laughs> So you jump in and then you're, you're sitting behind the girl you like, and I'm sitting behind the girl I like. And by the way, she ended up coming out to visit me in Kansas because I was stationed in Wichita, Kansas at the time. But uh, yeah, the Scottsdale, uh, the reason why I loved Austin, not so much now, but I, I used to love it so much, is the reason why I currently love Scottsdale. It's the easiest place with the least drama and least access problems that you have to be around the most women. Los Angeles is not that. Los Angeles is the, those parties that, like even the parties you were going to, you gotta get invited, and the more dudes you're, like for instance, if you come to Las Vegas, no place trumps Vegas. If you showed up, Eric, next week with 40 dudes, I could get 40 guys into a nightclub. It's not a problem for me. That's the difference. That's why I always love doing boot camps in Vegas. Yeah. I lived in Vegas. I've spent many years in Vegas. It's a place I can return to again and again. And I plan to. I plan on seeing you. I'm sure I'm gonna run a boot camp in let's do that. Vegas we'll do we'll do an immersion. we'll do a Vegas right. immersion MOA boot camp and we'll do it with you. Absolutely. Let's do that. Good times. That'd be great. I'll I'll, I'll yeah. handle all the logistics. I'll get you in everywhere. It'll be awesome. Uh Eric, um, so what other city? So you, is Scottsdale number one for you? Scottsdale is number two for me. Vegas uh, is number one for me. Uh okay. I would have to say Vegas is number one for me too, no doubt. Uh, the rooftop patios in the summertime, especially. Oh, Those you haven't you haven't great. been here since they opened Dre's. I just realized you haven't been here since they opened uh, Dre's. On, they, Reopened Dre's. I've been to Dre's. Right, I but, love Dre's. But the Cromwell. Dre's. So they got rid of Bill's Gambling Hall. They turned it into a hotel called the Cromwell, and then they put Dre's on top of the. It's a rooftop uh, club now. Okay. Yeah. No, no I was there. Uh, I the time flies. 
Marquis uh, Marquis is also rooftop, and then I Live. I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. Liv, Liv is also Liv is going. Live Beach is going to be a rooftop place inside of the Fountain Blue. It just opened up a couple of weeks ago. I am going to check them all out. Yeah, <laughs> That's what I'm, going to do. I'm looking for the love of my life. I'm looking everywhere. I'm looking under rocks. Yeah. Are there any other cities that you really like? Uh, in the states, well. New York City is its own animal. Mm. Very different from Miami, South Beach. I love South Beach. As I recall, I lived in, in Miami for a year with Matador and Love Drop. And uh, what else jumps out? San Diego. Yes. Is, I love Pacific Beach. It's quite nice. Hollywood. I, Hollywood promises uh, starlets. You know, people who are a little um, creative. Yeah. I like the creative type. You know, if you can sing, amazing. I met a comedian, a comedian uh, on my last trip. That was that, you know, it was really nice to meet her. Do you, uh, so you, you said you weren't able to keep up or meet up with Neil. Uh, Love Drop, do you talk to Chris ever? Uh we have chatted back and forth. He's he's in my online world. So you can confirm you can confirm that he is alive. Because I can, alive. okay, yeah. good. But let me ask you: Have you heard about Matador? No, it's been fifteen years since I've spoken to him. The very last thing I said to him was, "I'll see you on the flip side, brother." He dropped me off at the airport, and you haven't like seen he, him since. You know, would do sometimes, and I've never seen him since. I heard several years ago. Uh, we're talking about. Uh, Matador, James. my co-star yeah. from the TV show The Pickup Artist, Matador uh, just vanished off off of uh, you know social the the social net. Yeah. So I hope he's doing well. I heard that he has a son. Mm. I don't know. You know, I can't confirm that, but maybe that's what's keeping him busy right now. Right. Yeah. Because I heard that was a few years ago. So he must have a a son who's maybe five years old by now. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, I had another question from some people. What are your goals for later on in your life? What do you What do you plan to do from this point forward? You mentioned the the artificial intelligence stuff. Well, yeah. See, what's crazy is I've been following this artificial intelligence thing for a long time, some twenty years, and. I've completed the project. It's done. It's where I want it to be. It works. It's an operating system for your mind. You can go anywhere. It's, it's extraordinary. It's a way of accessing the AI's uh, language model database of knowledge within it. So, so it's, that's done. I have a bunch of other projects similar to that, but different that I would like to work on. There are magical devices. I'm very much into magic. And there are these magical devices that can, you know, with their secret use, can make you do astounding things, such as uh, levitating beer bottles. That's one example. And uh, and I'm fascinated by magical devices. Nice. Uh, so mm -hmm. one thing that happened, kind of got started with Mihao actually, who, who worked with you was the concept of the secret infield video. Now, I don't know if you've realized in the last couple of years, uh, YouTube has frowned upon that pretty, pretty harshly. And, uh, Owen, then RSD had to take all of their infield footage down. Can you talk about it what did. it was, what it was like back then? Well, because to be fair, and, and obviously I'm not talking about Mihao or Owen, but some guys were doing some seedy things on there and that's, that became yeah. there, there were a lot of, of, uh, Copyright complaints, women coming back and saying, I need this to be taken down, that kind of thing. Can you talk about that whole era? Yeah, it's the wild, wild web. It was a free-for-all. And uh, since then, policies have been put in place that limit the amount of egregious uh, misuse of, uh, of footage. So, you know, you can't without permission just video anywhere you know every state has its own laws we were able to film within a nightclub environment in scottsdale arizona because we had a sign on the front door saying that filming was taking place inside right so you know we got permissions 
But uh, if you don't get permissions, you shouldn't be using it. I don't have a lot of infield footage. I have children. I don't want them seeing what happens in the club. What happens in the club <laughs> stays in the club. We don't want cameras in the club. You know, one time I was filming in a club and, uh, you know, with permission. And uh, Marky Mark, Mr. Mark Wahlberg, he had asked the producer, you know, what are these cameras here for? He didn't want them. And they came to me and said, you know, Mr. Wahlberg doesn't want these cameras here. So I said, well, get rid of them. And we got rid of them and I had a good night without them we just because i love batman and it and if he says no cameras he it's like you're fucking right no yeah. cameras what was i thinking you know we shouldn't have cameras in here we're having fun uh I, there's one thing i want to ask you i've always wondered what was it like uh you know living with courtney love in the same house the you know kurt cobain's ex-wife and just randomly, that's right. It's that's one. Right. It's we became good friends. It's one of the most in this in the book, the game. It is one of the most like random things that kind of gets fit in there. That Courtney Love just comes to live with you guys. That's right. That's right. It was uh, extraordinary. Uh, we had all gotten together, you know, as a as a house, as a household, as a family, and had to talk about it. That she was in a position where she needed help. And we were as random as it needed to be for her to just hide away, you know, and be safe and, and, and heal. So uh, no one knew that she was living there. For the time she was there, we didn't tell people. We didn't say, oh, Courtney loves living with us. Nobody in the house mentioned it. And uh, she had safety there, you know. We're all good. We were all good guys, all of us. Do you ever talk to her? And I was hoping to, you know, see her again. But uh, my Hollywood trip was only 10 days and I didn't see Neil. So, you know, nothing got pulled together in time. Uh, Eric, you mentioned this also, like you came back and then a bunch of your friends were gone. And that's something like whenever I go back to Dallas, I notice that too. It's, uh, it's like, you got to start again. It, well, it's it's that, but it also feels like in general, and you may disagree with me on this, but I, in general, I do feel like social media has made it so that a lot of people can get their validation virtually and don't go. I, I just remember going out in LA in the early 2000s and there just being nothing but beautiful women in the clubs. And now I go out in LA and I'm lucky to see three. And it just feels like so many of them have just been pulled away because of social media but i don't know i mean you know, I, that 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 may be mm -hmm. but i'm not going to complain about it sure i'm just going to work that much harder you know rather than exercise my excuse making muscles of why i shouldn't go out yeah you know of how it's harder uh grind harder that's what bexter recommends he recommends you grind to find yeah you know it's 90 percent grind grinding through the the winter we we did a boot camp in the middle of negative 17 degree weather in january in toronto and uh we found the bubbles of love the venues were still happening the bubbles of love uh, they love weren't that. as packed yeah they weren't as packed i'll admit but doesn't it only take one girl to make you happy yeah maybe two maybe two uh the the other part was the concept of a wingman. I don't know if, if uh, Rob is there with you, but uh, the concept of having a wingman who kind of understands uh, every roommate I've had uh, since, you know, probably even before the first boot camp with you, I had them understand we're going to be up late. Sometimes there will be girls over. If you're not comfortable with this lifestyle, don't come here. The concept of having a wingman and like, what does your wingman need to know? Like one of my favorite things, especially now because I'm in a relationship, is helping my friends meet the girl of their dreams. It's one of the things that I've gotten really, I've really tried to do a lot. I host these huge events and I'm constantly introducing girls to guys to each other. Uh, can you talk about that concept of like, what makes a good wingman? What do you tell your wingman? Quite simply, what the fantasy is, is you want your wingman to have ESP. You want him to know what you, what your moves are, mm. what your plans are. You want him to predict what you are going to do next. Uh, who you're choosing, who who your interest is, 
you know? And if you switch targets, as they say, that he would have the wherewithal to know that you're doing that. You know, the man who opens the set leads the set. He doesn't own it. He just leads it. And uh, your wingman can come in and do accomplishment introductions on your behalf while you're away. And, uh, you know, it, the old saying is your wingman can get you laid. That's that's true. That's definitely true, man. Um, the concept of attraction is not a choice. Uh, the, that where a lot of people go, like for instance, I'll, I'll tell you the red pill community kind of came from this idea that a lot of men were being taught that they needed to check certain boxes, like logical boxes in order to generate attraction with women, right? If you be nice to girls, no, they need nice to get out in the field and meet the girls. Correct. Can you talk about those? So we just talked about attra attraction triggers before. Can you talk about that misunderstanding that she, you can't convince someone to be attracted to you. Attra attraction's not a choice. Yeah. Those are just amateurs. You know, there's there's a lot of theory coming from those who do not know. That's why they talk theory. Yeah. My theory comes from in field. Mine is backwards backwards engineered from that which worked. It it already happened. I've already lived the life. So I know what works. And what one man can do, another can do. It's learnable. You can learn structure. You can learn material. You can get good at the delivery. You can up your volume and velocity like a pro. You know, you have to. This game is quite difficult. If you're going to find a mate that you're going to connect with, you're going to have to meet quite a few women until you find a compatible partner. Mm. Beauty is not enough. So good luck getting out there and and meeting them. If you're going to do it one by one, you know, the the um, the Tinder dates, you know, how many do you set up, you know, and you meet them? Are you really looking for love? Are you looking for connection? Are you looking for intimacy? Or are you just looking for the one night stand? I don't teach the one night stand. I teach solid game. To me, a one night stand is failure. It's not a sexual relationship until there's a pattern of sex. And that would have to be at least three times. Three is a pattern, you know? So if you only have sex with a girl once and she doesn't allow you to have sex again, to me, that's abysmal failure. Mm. You still failed in your pickup. Um, one of the discussions I had with Kezia Noble was this concept of where like red pill now is basically there's a concept where they discuss intersexual dynamics, but there's a sec there's a, a sect of morality to it, meaning her what what is her body count? What's her political beliefs? Does she bring peace into your life? There's all these things that I don't ever remember us discussing in 2005. I don't ever remember ever not one time listening to you at a seminar talking about a girl's body count. I've never heard you talk about it, but it, it seems to be something that people are uh, much more interested in now. The red pill community, one of the things they do is there's a description or a prescription about you know what are red flags that a woman has in order for you to be in a long-term relationship with her. And I'm curious, from your standpoint, like you said before, beauty is common. So what are the things that if a guy's out there and he's looking for a long-term relationship, what are the things he should he should pick for in his partner? I think that'll be different for everybody, you know? I don't know why some men choose the women they choose, but they do, and vice versa, you know? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't. Why Why people choose? I, I could say what I'm interested in. Well, maybe, maybe, not, know, maybe, not, but, uh, maybe not why they choose, but more so like what are the things that you could, are there things that you see in a girl that where there's maybe too much chaos and you, this relationship's not going to break, uh, not going to work, and you see red flags before they happen? Or the, does that ever happen for you? Yeah, of course I see red flags, but I usually, you know, go for it anyway because when you qualify a girl, uh, for eight to 12 minutes, uh, and you can only do it once in your pickup, you know, in, in the timeline of pickup, that's not, it's not real qualification. You're not asking her a question that if she answers wrong, you're, you're going to now lose the set. What I'll do is I'll build enough friendship so I can, and comfort and trust so that I can see them again on another occasion, at which point I can then qualify them over a greater amount of time on the day two. It's almost a false qualifying, isn't it, uh, in, in uh, pickup, where we want them to invest in us 
And so we ask them questions to get them to do so, right? And if you're like me and you're fascinated by people, then you're going to ask some very intriguing questions to really understand quickly this, this person's experience on earth. You know, one of the things I say is um, from birth until now, the universe has been giving you a steady stream of experience. Yes. How's it been from birth until now? How's it been? That really spark, sparks off conversation. That gets that gets them investing. But if they don't answer properly, you know, or they a- answer with uh, vigor, they don't answer. Uh, they, they don't have an interest in answering. Like if you say, name three qualities that would make me want to get to know you more. And she says, three qualities, I don't want to answer that. You know, can you name one? Can you at least name one quality that would make your friend want to get to know you? One, can you keep it small? So baby step uh, compliance. Is, is my suggestion there a question I, some of my thoughts beautiful a question i get often is uh, a guy who's in the friend zone how does he get out of the friend zone what was your answer for that mm. guys in the friend zone sometimes it's easier just to start over than it is to fix a broken set mm. so but that aside how to fix the friend zone the friend zone by the way is where you invested everything in her she's asked you to move and you've helped her uh she's getting everything she would get from a boyfriend and she doesn't uh have to return any favors whatsoever you've been friend zoned what do you do get out of the house keep moving forward and find a woman who you're not going to get friend zoned in and continue to be friends with her just show her that you have options. There you go. You know, get another yeah. girl. Yeah. Get a girlfriend. She'll see that, and a jealousy plot line may ensue. And if it doesn't, then she you wreck the set anyway. You shouldn't fall into the let's just be friends. So showing your attractive pre-selection could could lever you out of the friend zone. Uh, it's it's a jealousy plot line. Yeah. It's it's a very strong emotion, and it, it does make a woman react. You know, a woman doesn't know she's attracted to you until she's surprised by the sense of jealousy a rival uh, creates. So sometimes you have to do that for her to know that she likes you. She won't know until she feels something. You described it as like an evolutionary pang. You used the word pang. I, I've actually stolen that before. That feeling right. that she gets that uh, she can't control, it just happens. She doesn't even know if she likes you. Not until a rival comes to take away her investment. And that's a pain. That's a strong emotional pain. It's uh, it's reserved for uh, moments where two women are meeting and they both like you and they're going to be super nice to each other. You know, oh, you're so pretty. Oh, you're so pretty. And fight for you. Now, some men want to have options of this nature but you can't do it unless you open two sets. So you have to have some skills. You have to have the ability to open more than one group in a night. So it's advanced. It's basic in that you can do it tonight. You know, you can go open up two sets and merge them and let two girls that show interest in you to meet. And you can even say, you're going to have to fight for me. It's worth it. And introduce the, the girl. You're going to have to fight for me. There we go. <laughs> Jealousy plotline. Uh, you've talked about your heterosexual life partner, uh, Mr. Baxter there. Can you describe, like, uh, how does your uh, relationship work with the business? How does the business function? Who handles what? Because the reason why I bring it up is because I remember, you know, I, I'd hung out with uh, Love Drop a lot uh, for a while when he was in uh, Los Angeles. He was the first person who ever said the word Bitcoin to me was, was LD. I remember. Uh, but he did a lot of the... Uh, uh, mystery created the art and LD wrote it down. Does, it, does that sound, right. fair? He, sound fair? He, he basically uh, came with me on boot camp after boot camp. And there came a point where he could actually run my seminar components when I was trashed. You know, sometimes you don't get enough sleep on a boot camp and you need just one extra hour. Bro, those seminars so were 12 hours in. long. You you guys would go yeah, for 12 hours. 12, for those of you guys who don't know, we would do 12 hours listening to the mystery would talk for like two and then it'd be fucking six hours out in the field in Houston. Like we would just go ham. Yeah, we would, you know, it's, it's a limited 
three day weekend. Yeah. And we would use our time wisely and get a lot of change work done. You know, there's theory in the day. And then at nighttime, it's application. We're applying it. We're going to meet the women and face reality like a fire hose of reality head on. That's what we would do. And that's what I continue to do. That's what we're planning on doing in Barcelona. All right. So next up. So it's you and Baxter, Baxter your, your wingman, are you guys putting out a product? Because uh, back in the day, the products were on DVD. Are you guys planning? And I'm asking you this because I have a product now. I, it's Mine's on, um, I'm using School. I used to use Kajabi. Are you planning on putting yeah. out a, a set of videos, anything like that, a course? How long would it be? Do you plan on doing like a subscription model? Do you plan on doing that in addition to the fact that you're going to have infield boot camps? What is the business? Sounds all business to me. Uh, what I've done is, We've recorded my seminars okay. over many years and taken highlight uh, clips of all the footage that we've had and cut it down to, I don't even know what it's down to now. I believe it's down to 25 hours, but it was 40. Mm. And uh, we've trimmed it down to size to make a course. When that course is revealed, uh, is uh, that would be something I would, ha would have to ask Baxter. Awesome. Uh, I, I made a course. Uh, I'd love for you to see it, man. But it's it's kind of I made it based on what my friend Ty Lopez taught me uh, and then several other guys. I, I know. Ty. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah that's no, right. No. Um, so, uh, you know, that's part of the reason why I filmed it the way that I did. But I'd just be very interested if you ever want any help when it comes to inculcating that part of it. Um, this is something that I've we've we've grown our company to almost eight figures from from uh, from from using well, the course good, model. Good to hear. Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's something that Baxter would take uh, take a look at. Uh, I, you know, he's assembling the product from the content that I've provided, that both he and I have provided. The other thing, and so I that's know, how we're this putting is, it together. This is more of a businessy, like social media kind of question, but like the concept of like more content. We're my team now does forty clips of me a day. I know some people that it's even more so than that. And I'm just curious. Like, That's a lot of Michael Turkey. <laughs> but I'm saying uh, uh, I do 11 hours of content per week. I make 11 hours of new content per week now. And I'm just curious. Is that Baxter? Is he trying to jump in? Yeah, let him, uh, let's, we can do a three-way screen there. Um, it, yeah. is, that, is that something you plan on doing in the future? Because there's new firms that are out there that can take all of your content and chop it up. Well, like I, I have a, a firm that works for me. And they, like I said, they make 40 clips a day. They post 150 clips of me per day. That's what they do. And in doing so, we're able to, to grow the business. And it's not as expensive. It's not that expensive. What, what I'm, what I'm trying to say sounds, is, Eric, people want to see more of you. All right. Sounds interesting. I do have interest in making a 3D uh, VR YouTube channel. I thought that would be a, a, an interesting way. Sure. But by the way, we have Mr. Robert Beck, a.k.a. Baxter from London. Hey guys. How's it going? All well? Nice. Doing nice. Well, we've been talking about pickup and going back in the day at Project Hollywood. And we even brought you up. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Good to be here. Just catching up. So uh, what's happened? So, so Rob, I'm going to ask you a question. So when I first met Eric, uh, we were at, we were in Dallas, Texas. We went to like the W hotel. We went to a party and then we went to like <laughs> another party and, uh, and I saw him there and was just really impressed with what I saw. He, he introduced these two girls together and, and I was just, I, you know, saw some pretty impressive stuff. What was your first impression? Like what, how did you guys meet? Um, Eric was doing a book tour and I was running the VIP club scene down in London and I, I had my own company as well doing pickup. And I said, oh, I'll host an event for you and come and you can come and chat to loads of fans. And we took the a VIP club and Eric came down and did a two hour talk. And then we parted after and uh, met some cool people and literally from then started doing boot camps together and traveling the world. So it was as simple as just immediately again right we're on the same level here we're on the same spectrum of our mind sure. we've both got a, we both know what we want we're both into pickup you know and we both love teaching and uh, obviously being in field so they're all good uh good ticks for becoming good friends i have i have two business we have Go shared ahead. commonalities yes shared commonalities uh, i have two business partners we read the book called the e-myth revisited where it goes over the concept of the um 
It goes over the concept of the technician, the entrepreneur, and the manager. And I realized very quickly on, I'm not the manager and I'm not the entrepreneur, I'm the technician. I wanna be in front of the students, I wanna be coaching, that's really all I wanna do. I really don't wanna do anything else. Now I've got myself into the technical side of it a little bit more as far as filming is concerned and buy, like ad spend and stuff like that. Is that how you guys sort of divvy up the responsibilities? <clears throat> do you handle more of the managerial or entrepreneurial role? And uh, and oh, and uh, Eric does more of the, tr he's more of the technician. He's more of the one who's out there instructing? Uh, well, I think Eric and I um, definitely love being in field. So yeah. we, we do the infield part always. We, we're, we're there together through the whole boot camp anyway. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Eric's, ex, like the one thing I love Eric to do where I want to walk away and just let him do it is structure. His structure is, you know, so far perfect that we can see, you know, yeah. it's a great structure. It works. Loads of people have modeled things off that. And uh, so I think the structure is very important. And then we've got the material, which we both uh, input to. Mm. Uh, we're constantly coming up with stuff, you know, and rifting it off each other, field testing it, giving it to students if it works well. And then the delivery, we go out together, we take them out on a night out, four hours or more each night. That could be double sometimes. <laughs> and uh, run them through the ropes and give them instant feedback on what they're doing. And uh, we've been doing it for so long now, 15-ish years, that we can do it, you know, we can do it with our eyes closed. Is it just the two of you when you guys do boot camps? Do you have any other parts of the company? Sometimes we have like an assistant or a okay. approach coach, but really it's just us. Nice, nice. Okay, well, I'm really And interested. sometimes we do collabs and so on, joint Got ventures, it. when nice. we do touring. Nice. Any chance we're going to get a, a podcast from you guys? Maybe something you do on a regular basis where you create content and just maybe take some Q and A's. I mean, I'm always down for it. Yeah. So it's, up, you know, up to season. Yeah. I, how, how about I do other people's podcasts? It's easier. Yeah. I'd like to see Eric on a panel show. So like whatever fresh and fit, uh, to maybe Pearl Davis, the uh, purple pill or mine access Vegas. I'd love, I'd love to see you guys come on one of those. I think that'd be really cool. It's so basically it's the two hosts and then 10 girls. And then you guys are the guests. Ooh. Yeah. Well, I mean, were they single? Huh? What'd you say? Sounds good. Uh, yeah. We, yeah. We, uh, have, we have been chatting, actually, to them. So uh, I think we're doing a little bit of a podcast run now. Okay. It seems. Incredible. But one at a time. In incredible. They're fun. As long as I get to do it from the comfort of my home, this is absolutely great. This is great. All right. Oh. Anyway, I just want to say, I want to reiterate what Owen said before. People just want to know that you guys are, you know, the value is incredible, but I think a lot of people, Eric, just wanted to know. I get this question all the time because they know, they've seen, I have a ton of pictures of you and me back when we used to go out. And people ask, like, what happened to Eric? What's going on? And you and I would message every once in a while on Facebook or whatever, but it's really good. This is the first time we've probably spoken since uh, April of 2014. Uh, so it's really good to actually see you. I think a lot of people uh, around the world are just happy. Just want to know that you're happy. Just want to know that you're successful. It, you you have two healthy kids that you love. You get to spend time with, and I think a lot of people are just interested to know that. Yeah, I've lived a a private life over the last ten years. I've been able to afford that. The celebrity that was an experiment for me to begin with. I wasn't all that into needing fame. Uh, it was. It was a boot camp that I was doing that turned into a TV show. Yeah. So, you know, it was something I was doing anyway that we just captured. And then I continued doing that. Uh, I shied away from celebrity. I shied away from doing the big talk shows. You know, I was doing talk show runs. And uh, I decided to spend more time with my kids when I could, you know. Uh, I also decided to, uh, you know, keep my kids out of the limelight uh, until they're ready to have a voice and, and speak for themselves, you know. Uh, that's why I have no infield footage. I'm not into it. I don't want it. I don't want it out there, you know. I, I've already got uh, infield footage from my VH1 TV show, and that is seminal, you know. That is some good stuff. So, uh, you know, if someone wants to try to beat that infield footage, go for it. Nice. It okay. stands for itself. Awesome. Do you guys have any, I know you said you're going to Barcelona. Is there anything you guys have specific in the future? When's the next time you're coming to North America? 
Oh, well, we're definitely coming. We just need to put some dates up. And at the moment, uh, things are still work in progress. But Barcelona's next on the list. Uh, we will be going to probably Tokyo at some point. So anyone out there who's uh, on the scene there, let us know. And uh, yeah, so we, we we like to do world tours. So we pick our favorite places. Like yeah, we have places like Helsinki and so on. So we're definitely going to be doing Helsinki this year in the summer, for example. But we like to try new places as well. And the game works everywhere. You know, when you have world class pickup, it works everywhere. Yeah. So you know, there are some slight nuances. You know, if you're in South America, it's a bit more slightly more dance game. Doesn't mean you have to dance, but you know. There's different uh, moves for different places, but definitely the structure works the same. That's awesome. Um, I don't know, but back in the day, the Venusian Arts used to have a forum where people could go on there and like leave uh, comments and then people would reply. Since then, a lot of different communities, like my community, we used to be on Discord and we moved over to school. Do you guys have any plans for a community where a lot of guys can join for free and then maybe Mystery comes on like once a, a week or once a month and just answers questions? Well, we do have a forum on school nice. called Attraction Unleashed. Nice. And I participate, you know, when I can on that forum. Yeah, it's, it. you know, the Mysteries Lounge no longer exists. Yeah. Now we have Attraction Unleashed. That's awesome. Yeah, I was going to recommend school just because if you guys do come out with a course, you don't have to do separate where it's um, Discord and Kajabi. You can actually just do all of it on school. Uh, school is great. The only the only disadvantage to school is that it won't do a paid and a free site on the same school server like Discord will. Discord will do. You can have your paid clients and your free clients. If you ever looked at um, the the real world, uh, Andrew Tate's course, it was there was a paid side and then you get, you would level up and other things were unlocked for you. You can't do that with school. So we have two school servers: one for our free clients and then one for the 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 ones who've joined the program. So that's that's been absolutely fantastic for us, along with a schedule, which I'm looking forward to seeing. I'm going to join your school server and then check out your schedule. I don't know if you guys saw Alex or Mosey just said he made the biggest investment of his life into school. So I think that platform is going to really blow up and become a lot more robust. Sounds good. Yeah. We've got a long time into it. Yeah. We don't yet have a course on school, but we are creating a course elsewhere. And uh, we've talked about creating a mini course for the uh, school platform. That's nice. uh, perhaps in the works. Nice. Eric, are you going to be in London from now on? Or are you going back to Toronto? I'm here for three weeks, then I'm off to Barcelona for a few weeks, and uh, then, Dexter, we're going to have to talk about where to go next, man. Yeah, we're going to have to uh, put some pins in the globe. Love That's it. Right. Yeah. I love it, man. Well, hey, man, I, I just really want to thank All you right. so much. This was, uh, you know, I did a, I watched every one of your videos over again. I had a, wanted to come out with a, a bunch of questions, and it's just really great to see you. I'm very happy that you're doing well. Uh, you meant a, a lot to a lot of people. Uh, that industry has changed a ton, but I think like you opened the door for a lot of things. I, I think uh, a lot of people don't recognize that a lot of the Manosphere Red Pill community wouldn't even exist had Rolo Tomasi not created what he created through the Rational Mail and the pickup community. The same thing with you, specifically you and Neil and, and Owen Cook, you guys creating that and now it's just it's sort of a derivative of that and so i think that's that's pretty amazing that you you're out here you're doing this again uh, and it's really good to see you and i'm glad that you're doing well man there's always a top dog there's always the next guy but they can't take away first i'm the first to do infield boot camps and i'm the first to, to have created this this uh very uh broad industry so uh, you can't take away first. Well, I am looking very much forward to having you and Rolo on a show together. That is going to be, uh, that's going to crack the earth right there. That's going to break the internet. Awesome, man. Okay, good time. All right, man. Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us. For those of you who are watching, man, I want to say I really appreciate uh, the growth that's it's happened. Uh, we're up to uh, 3 million views a month, and, I, and I'm just like stunned that you guys are still watching my show this month. Um, the, the growth has been out, outstanding. Uh, the people who are joining MOA, I want to say thank you to all the new members who've just come in here recently. If you guys are looking to be a high ticket setter or closer, we're still looking to hire, go to MOA mentoring.com forward slash jobs. We're still hiring, uh, make between 10 and 15 K. Well, we have one guy just made 20 K a month, uh, working for us as a closer. So if you're looking for that, please come and apply, make sure you follow Eric and make sure you follow Baxter. Eric, where's the best place we can find you on IG it's ask mystery and on the internet, it's askmystery.com. Nice. Find out more. Rob, where can we find you? 
Rob Bexter, and also the YouTube channel is Rob Bexter. Awesome. Awesome, man. Very nice. Well, man, thank you guys for joining us. And for everybody else out there, I will see all of you next week.